Welcome back to One Piece Explained. Chapter 1088 officially came out yesterday, and I'm sorry for being a little late with this breakdown. The official live action trailer dropped on One Piece Day over the weekend, and I put all of my time and effort into breaking that down and getting that video out. Speaking of which, thank you all so much for your support on that video and this channel in general. At the time of recording, it has over 40,000 views and we have over 500 subscribers on this channel. This absolutely blows my mind. The morning before I put that video out, I was sitting at around 90 subs and hoping that we would hit our 100 subscriber benchmark at some point, and my breakdown for the teaser trailer I had was around 7,000 views after a month. This is just all so crazy to me. Thank you so much. I'm so glad people share my passion and love for the series, and thank you for being patient with me as I navigate this whole YouTube thing. I've been doing everything myself from the research to gathering the assets like the clips and panels, to writing the script, recording, editing, even to making the fun thumbnails and the music you hear right now at the start and end of each video. This is truly a passion project and a labor of love, and I'm really excited to be able to do this. I can't wait to continue breaking down the live action series as well as the manga, and with that said, let's take a look at chapter 1088, Final Lesson. We start off this chapter with a flashback at the old Marineford, where we find Garp giving a lecture to a class of young marines. We can make out Kobe, Helmeppo, and what may be Kujaku and Prince Gru here as well. Despite all of the crazy stuff going on in this chapter, probably my favorite detail is the inclusion of this marine here, who is actually one of the marines that were part of Vice Admiral Suru's crew or entourage during the Law of Flashback and the end of Dress Rosa. She even has an outfit closely resembling the outfit she wore all the way back then. This scene likely takes place around the time of the Diary of Kobe Meppo cover story, and this is probably the first instance that I can remember that we've seen in the manga of marines being trained via a lecture, instilling in them the general code of conduct and sense of justice that all marines are supposed to follow. Garp explains his take on a variation of lifeboat ethics, a thought experiment regarding morality where you're presented with a single lifeboat with limited room and some number of people with varying conditions or characteristics, and you have to decide what the best course of action is and who to save. In this scenario, Garp presents one lifeboat with room for two people, a baby and an old man. Kobe, being the selfless lad he is, immediately suggests giving up his own spot so the two civilians can live on, but Garp rejects his idea completely, explaining that they all join the marines to protect people's futures, and that the correct answer is to save the two people who have the most quote-unquote amount of prospective future left. We've seen this philosophy in action a couple of times in the series. The first thing that came to my mind was when Roger was convincing Garp to take care of his unborn child, Ace. Roger seemed very sure that Garp would protect Ace after his death, and at the time, we thought this was likely just because Garp is a stand-up guy, but now in hindsight, it's really cool to consider that Roger may have realized that this was Garp's philosophy behind his actions the whole time, and played into it. You may have also realized that this is very similar to what Kuzan, another of Garp's students, did back during the O'Hara incident when he chose to save a young Nico Robin, who had a lot more potential in her future over the defected Marine, Jaguar D. Saul. Of course, we would later learn on that Saul was actually alive and just frozen in Kuzan's ice time capsule and we'll touch back on this concept later in the video. And while the East Blue is fresh on my mind from the live action breakdown, I'll note that this is also similar to what Zeph chose to do when he decided to preserve Sanji's life over his own by giving him the remaining amount of food they had after being stranded on an island during a storm. We jump forward in time, a few weeks before present day, to find out how the conflict at Amazon Lily between the Kuja, Blackbeard, and the Marines actually got resolved. Before, we were under the impression that Rayleigh mediated the situation, but it turns out Kobe had some involvement as well. Blackbeard had taken 800 marine soldiers as well as a battleship hostage, likely in order to use as a bargaining chip for him to acquire the status of nationhood and world government affiliation, which we recently learned was his current ambition. This tactic reminds me a lot of what Law did during the time skip to become a warlord, when he took the hearts of 100 marines captive as a bargaining chip for warlord status. It's also interesting to note that Law was considered the mastermind of the Rocky Port incident, which happened on Blackbeard's territory, Fololed, where Kobe saved a bunch of civilian lives and got dubbed a hero of the marines. There's been a weird history between Blackbeard, Law, and Kobe, and it feels like we're finally getting some of it addressed and paid off during this current arc. Kobe offers himself as a captive in exchange for the freedom of the marine soldiers and the battleship, echoing his answer to Garp's lifeboat ethics question. Blackbeard notes how highly Kobe thinks of his own life, which is a slight callback to that scene where Kobe is embarrassed for thinking so highly of himself that someone would come save him, and the scene from last chapter where he thought that Shiryu was actually after him. Kobe's sense of self-worth is a big recurring theme across this arc that leads up to the big climax of this chapter, which we'll get to soon. One thing I want to note real quick, Vice Admiral Yamakaji, who we had seen initially leading the attack on Amazon Lily, is informed that Kobe is a member of S.W.O.R.D. This is interesting to me, because it reinforces the idea that S.W.O.R.D. itself is not necessarily a secret amongst the Marines, but rather the individual members of S.W.O.R.D. are not explicitly known. We cut back to present day on Fololed, as we resume where we left off last chapter, Pizarro's giant island hand coming down to crush Garp's ship, while all the Marines and the civilians are stunned and shocked by their impending doom. 
Tishigi, though, is able to stay calm and give out the necessary orders to ensure their chances at survival. I'm glad we get this small moment from Tishigi here. I've been a little disappointed at Oda's handling of her character in this arc, as she hasn't really done much. She remained on the ship when the members of S.W.O.R.D. went out to rescue Kobe, and in the last chapter, we saw her attending to Habari, who was frozen by Kuzan. Though I think there may be a good reason for this, seeing as how she hasn't been stated to be a part of S.W.O.R.D. You see, only S.W.O.R.D. members can actively go against Emperors of the Sea and their crews, which explains why she, along with a bunch of other marine soldiers, would have remained on the ship. Garp, of course, hasn't been stated to be a member of S.W.O.R.D. either, but he has a history of acting on his own and is able to get away with this due to his prestige that he acquired during the events of God Valley. Though, I am excited to see where Tashigi's character goes from here. This is probably the most notable instance of her being depicted somewhere without Smoker. Maybe he's on his way to Egghead with the other marine battleships, or maybe he's back on G14 looking after the kids from Punk Hazard. Either way, I'm really excited to see where the story takes both Tashigi and Smoker. Back on Full Lead itself, we pick up from a shot that's almost immediately after where Garp was after being knocked back from his clash with Kuzan in the chapter prior. Just to nitpick a little bit, there may be a small continuity error here, or at the very least, it's messing with my understanding of the island. In the last chapter, we saw Garp and the three sword members with their back to the face of the skull, and we know the hand is further out from where they are, way in front of the skull. Whereas in this chapter, we see the hand extending from behind where Garp and the marines are, which places them facing toward the face of the skull and I don't think they moved and repositioned themselves between the end of last chapter and this chapter. It's not really important, but I thought I'd just mention it anyway. Kobe is anxious and worrying about what to do about Pizarro's hand, when Garp encourages the three young members and gives them direct orders on how to handle the situation. Garp has complete faith in his former students here, and tells Kobe to destroy the hand while Prince Groose defends the ship and Helmepo distracts the enemy forces. We get this page of Kobe faltering and all the enemy pirates downplaying Kobe with even Groose wondering how Garp expects Kobe to destroy the hand, but Garp has good reason to put his faith in him which we'll get to in just a second. Helmeppo goes to stop a cannonball aimed toward Kobe, and we get this panel of time slowing down as Helmeppo looks like he's going to strike it away only to get hit directly and take the brunt of the explosion. Not quite what we had in mind, but hey, it worked. Hmm, if only there were someone on full of lead that could deflect cannonballs. Hmm. Garp and Kuzan are both back on their feet, and Kuzan asks Garp about his wounds. To me, this exchange seems to be written in a way that could be interpreted as both a taunt or genuine concern on Kuzan's part, and this opportunity for ambiguity is important as we'll discuss later. Garp runs right up to Kuzan, catching him off guard and puts him back down, as Garp hops off the buildings of Fololed, rushing toward Pizarro. This reminded me a lot of Bellamy using his spring hopper to move between all the various buildings on Jaya, which was the first explosive pirate island that we saw in the series. Garp hits Pizarro hard with a Galaxy Divide. Now, this is very similar to the Galaxy Impact he used earlier in the arc, with the key difference being how the Shockwave manifests the damage to the target. Galaxy Impact seems to crumble everything in its wake, whereas the Galaxy Divide seems to have a bit more precision, splitting the target in two. And apparently, the characters using the Japanese name of this attack is a reference to a katana technique where you deliver a downward vertical slice. Kinda neat with the idea that his final move is perhaps a parting gift to Sword. And real quick, there's a fun cat and dog thing going on here, with Pizarro having a speech quirk where he talks like a cat, and Garp having the dog-themed ship and the dog headpiece when he was first initially introduced. We get another quick flashback to the days of the Kobe Helmeppo cover story, where Garp learns that Kobe has actually been doing some training of his own in secret. He's been going off at night to practice against the battleship bags that we were introduced to in the previous chapter, the ones that Garp and Kuzan both trained upon. This realization is what gives Garp his confidence and faith in Kobe. You see, Kobe throughout this arc, and even when he was first introduced, didn't have much confidence in himself, but had very firm aspirations. He was riddled with self-doubt. Garp, being the great teacher he is, believes in all of his students, and he knew deep down that Kobe would be capable of great things, like destroying the giant hand in this chapter. This adds a little bit more context to his line from the last chapter about justice prevailing. That said, Kobe jumps ahead in front of it and winds his fist back, imbuing it with armament hockey, mirroring Garp in this chapter. Whenever something like this happens, there's always discussion about whether this is actually Conqueror's hockey or not as both are depicted with black lightning. I would say in this case that it's not, because when we usually see Conqueror's Hockey at play, it's often explicitly stated by somebody, and also you can sort of tell by the thickness or the severity of the lightning that's being exuded. Kobe delivers an honesty impact, delivering a small shockwave that ripples through and breaks apart Pizarro's hand, much to everyone's surprise. Honesty impact is honestly sort of a corny name for an attack admittedly, but I think it works very well to service the earnest, straightforward nature of Kobe. You'll also notice that in both instances of Pizarro being attacked, his smaller form takes physical damage, with his face being sliced by the Galaxy Divide earlier and his arm being cut up by the Honesty Impact. 
This, along with his comments about feeling the burns from the last chapter, leads me to believe that Pizarro's Isle Isle fruit, despite seeming to be a more capable version of Pika's Stone Stone fruit, has the drawback of making the user feel any damage done to the island that they are manipulating, whereas Pika was able to manipulate and merge with any given stone structures, but would only receive damage if the section that he was currently in was being attacked. This is also a neat parallel to Blackbeard's Dark Dark fruit, which maintains any damage done to his corporal form. Barb laughs in joy at his student's great feat, reminding me a lot of how he would laugh whenever Luffy would do something great. Groose once again expresses a bit of envy over Kobe and blocks the rubble with his Glorp Glorp Fruit's powers, using the Glorp Web. Now, there was a really fun wild theory back in the day that Prince Groose was somehow related to the Don Quixote family in some form, with him being introduced on Dress Rosa, looking eerily like Rosinante, especially with how he sat, as well as having the title or name of Prince. And I'll admit that the Glorp Web reminded me a bit of Doflamingo's spider web technique. This is likely more than nothing, and I was just reminded of the fun theory when I saw this and wanted to share. Groose saves the ship from the falling rubble, and Helmeppo saves the falling Kobe. Habari and Kobe reunite and they all celebrate as Garp calls into the ship, instructing them to sail away as fast as they can. Kobe yells at Groose to turn the ship back around, but Groose holds him down as he holds back his tears. Garp finally answers the question that Groose had asked in the previous chapter. You see, when Garp first arrived on Fulolet, he proclaimed that Kobe was the future of the Navy, causing Groose to wonder if he was also. Here, Garp with his last words declares that they are all the future of the Navy. And this, of course, ties back to the start of the chapter with the lifeboat ethics. Garp chose to save the younger people, the future of the Navy, and sacrifices himself, the old man. So we cut back to full of lead and find Garp on the ground, seemingly impaled by a spike made of ice and laughing surrounded by the Blackbeard pirates. San Juan Wolf seems to have woken up and is back on his feet, while Pizarro looks down in anger through the skull of the island. Now, I think the most straightforward interpretation of this scene is to think that this is the end of Garp's life. After all, he's doing the thing where people with the will of D laugh at the face of their death. But I don't necessarily buy this. When Oda kills someone off that's supposed to actually be dead, we see the final corpse and it's not left vague by a narrator. Instead, I think Garp will be kept alive and be used as the Blackbeard Pirates' new bargaining chip for their plan with the world government. After all, Garp is likely more important to the Marines than Kobe is. However, this may change after the events of this arc. Seeing as how Garp is not actually a member of S.W.O.R.D. and went against the Emperor's crew, and with all of the shifting power dynamics in the world, maybe the world government doesn't find Garp as necessary as a force of power on their side anymore. This is also maybe why Garp chose to sacrifice himself, knowing that if he left with the battleship, the Blackbeard Pirates would just pursue them, but if he stayed behind, he could be the target of their anger as well as their new pawn in their plans. I also think that it's possible that this ice stabbing through Garp here is actually a means of stemming any potential bleeding from Garp's previous wound from Shiryu, and that Kuzan's potentially freezing Garp with an ice time capsule here. You see, most of the time that we've seen the ice ice fruit be used offensively to freeze an opponent, it's a near instantaneous freeze, whereas the ice time capsule tends to be a slow creeping one. We can also see that Kuzan expresses a bit of remorse here, similar to how he did with Saul, and if you look closely, you can even make out what may be Kuzan's tears being frozen over. And I don't think this is just part of the freezing effects design, as these shapes aren't there when he uses his powers on other occasions. The narrator gives us a preview of the next day's newspaper, which thankfully didn't include Pizarro's 40 word headline from the previous chapter, as it recaps the events of Full of Lead that we just saw play out, and leaves Garp's fate up to being a disappearance instead of an explicit defeat or death likely an attempt to cover up this major blow to the marines. We cut back to Egghead with the marine and world government ships approaching. Finally, it's been months since we've last had an update on the Straw Hat crew, and I can't wait to get back into the central story of this arc. The narrator has the newspaper suggesting that Luffy barricaded himself with an Egghead, and this may just be some editorialized reporting at play. When Morgans initially had gotten the word of the events of Egghead, he was going to print a paper saying that Luffy was holding Vegapunk hostage, a very unfair interpretation of the situation. This may be another case of that, as we know the island has a defense system that was being tampered with by York to prevent people from coming in or getting out, and of course, that's something only we as readers know, so it makes sense for the paper to think this is all the act of Straw Hat Luffy. And that's about it for chapter 1088. There is a break next week, so there won't be a chapter breakdown on Sunday, but I do have something planned along the lines of a quick refresh of any hanging plot lines or ongoing mysteries that we currently have with the characters on Egghead, and I'll try my best to keep it pretty brief. With all that said, I just want to say thank you again for all the tremendous support with the channel and the live action trailer breakdowns. It means so much to me that you're enjoying it, and I love making these videos, and I hope to be able to continue doing this for as long as possible. The live action series comes out on August 31st, and I intend on making breakdowns for every episode. I upload videos at least once a week on Sundays when the manga chapter officially comes out, and I'm starting to do a second upload during the week that isn't necessarily tied to the current manga chapter. Once again, thank you so much for your support and your patience with me as I figure out this channel. If you think I missed anything, please let me know in the comments, or if you have anything you want me to cover, I'd love to hear your thoughts. 
And if you like the videos I make, I'd really appreciate you subscribing and helping the channel grow. We also have a Discord now with people who want to explain One Piece as much as I do. It's a small community so far, but we'll get there. Thanks for watching this far into the video, and I hope to see you in the next one.